So we have the words of God. You know, and, and, and we have all this, the scriptures before us. We have, we have all the books. And we, I hear people say, I'm waiting to hear a word from God. Well, I'll tell you what. He begins by, by the response that is given in our baptism. When it's said to us, do you renounce the devil in all of his ways? Do we really renounce him? Well, glory to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're eight days past Pentecost. It's in that time and period of the church when they call the ordinary days. We go to the green color on our pyramids. You know, we're past all the special days, the festival days. We're now in that regular day-to-day time. And when we talk about how busy it is at Christmas and Easter and with the extra midweek services and, and Advent and Lent and all the busy times of you know, preparing for family visits and everything, all the things that keep us busy. But tell me the truth. Is it any less busy in the ordinary days? Yeah. We've got sports programs. We've got extra activities for the kids. You know, as a church, we just finished VBS. Right now we're working on getting this mission trip ready. All who are involved in, in, in the church activities, but then there's the family activities. You got, you know, you're trying to get your vacation scheduled and in that time with the family. You got just a few weeks and you're trying to build in vacation time for that. And all the other things, you know, getting the lawn cut and the groceries done, the laundry finished. Um, and then it's getting the kids ready to get back to school. That's only another month away. Life is busy. And the risk of all that busyness and noise is that it makes it harder to hear the Word of God. You know, sometimes I think that's the purpose of all the busyness. If the volume would just get high enough, we don't, we don't have to confront our own failures, our idols, or our own shortcomings. This is not a new problem. In fact, this is what Amos was addressing when he was when we read about him in the Old Testament reading from this morning. As he warned the Israelites in the northern kingdom, listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> so the time of Amos is about 760 B.C. And Amos is just a regular guy, a shepherd. A guy who made his living scraping figs. And he lived in the southern kingdom of Judea. More of a blue-collar guy than a blue bloodline was Amos. When God called him, the word says he took him. It sounds almost like Amos was saying he, he was pretty happy with what he was doing, and God took him out of that. And God sent Amos to the northern kingdom as his messenger. You know, the promised land by this time had been split apart, divided into Israel in the north and Judea in the south. The northern kingdom of Israel did not want the people traveling into the south for religious observances. So they went ahead and made their own. And you know, this, this northern kingdom, um, you know, in some of the Bible studies we've been doing recently, we talk about, uh, um, you know, the ten tribes and, and the two who... Um, uh, it, you know the the ten spies who who didn't want to see um, didn't want to attack the the holy land um, said the people were too big and that they would they would that we would lose the battles and then there was the two that said uh, you know we, we got them God's got our back and um, that's sort of the division really that happens between the north and the south you get these ten tribes and they seem to um, um, don't have quite the trust. Uh, their, their faith is not always carries them through. They don't always seem to listen when God speaks. So you got um, this northern kingdom, and, and they decide that, you know, rather than risk our people going into the south and, and hearing opposing points of view from, from what we've told, told them, this, the, you know, that you don't need to go to Jerusalem. You know, you can, we, got, we got Dan here, and we got, and that's not you, Dan, it's a, it's a town. Um, and and um, we, we've got uh, uh, 
Bethel. And so we've got these other places where you can come and, 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 uh, and do your observances to God. Even though that's not what God said to do, but that's what we're going to do. And they, they actually become that place where Jesus, you know, in Jesus' time, they tra the travelers tried to avoid the Samaria. They tried to go around it. This is um, a land that always seemed to be um, out of step, if you would, with what, um, with what God had planned for His people in this land of milk and honey. But you look at the northern kingdom, you know, if you read about it in 1 Kings, we learn that under Jeroboam II's leadership, the people of Israel in the northern kingdom lived a relatively comfortable and they were at peace with their neighbors. The economy was booming. The borders had expanded and they were secure. The nation was at peace with its sister kingdom. Jeroboam II's reign achieved what few kings in Israel had accomplished since the days of Solomon. Known for his military prowess and leadership, Jeroboam reclaimed portions of territory from the Syrians who had been weakened through their fights with the Assyrian Empire. Jeroboam II and the armies of Israel successfully reclaimed Damascus. Unfortunately, these victories did little to turn the hearts of people, the Israel people, back to God. In many ways, the territory recaptured by Jeroboam was the crowning success of his tenure. And since the people of Israel rested in this political prosperity and, and they sort of trusted in Jeroboam's leadership, God found it necessary to send his prophets to remind the nation that true victory belongs to God alone. And as the ministries of both prophets sent by God, Amos and Hosea, would reveal earthly comfort, political victory, material prosperity, these rarely are signs of God's favor. Especially for those who have forsaken God and whose hearts have grown calloused to His Word. And it's at this time Amos arrives from Judea and declares to the northern kingdom of Israel, listen, Listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say. In our reading today, there's, there's a few short conversations that are taking place. Um, and the first one is between God and Amos. And Amos is given a message to take to the people of Israel. God's not happy with the people of Israel. And he tells Amos that he will use a plumb line. Now, we got a picture up there of a plumb line, and, and Dan sort of explained it as we, uh, as we had the children's message. You know, they take this, this string and they put a weight on the bottom of it, and they'll put it up against a wall or, or they'll, uh, you know, some sort of construction, and they'll make sure that it stays straight from the bottom to the top. So they use it a lot in construction, and um, they make sure, you know, that the wall doesn't fall over. That's the idea of what a plumb line is for. But God is going to use this plumb line differently. It's not to show how straight the wall is. He's going to tell them, this is how warped you become. A person could use a plumb line to build a straight fence. Today, God is going to show why that fence is no longer straight and that it needs to come down. Included in this judgment, God promises to destroy these temples which have been built to honor idols, false gods, which have led the people away from the one true God because Jeroboam had been unfaithful and had ignored the commands of God by building these temples, by taking credit for the prosperity of the land. God now promises to allow the land to be a conquered nation. Amos went into the land with this message that Jeroboam would be killed by the sword and the people would be taken into exile. So the second conversation, now this is what God told Amos he's going to go into. And then the second conversation is between Amos and Amaziah. This guy Amaziah is a priest at one of these temples, one of these idol-worshiping places. This is his position. And it's... It's a position of high regard. In fact, 
so highly regarded that he could send a message to the king and know that it was heard. And the message he sent was this Amos guy who came up from the southern kingdom. He's saying all these politically incorrect things. Like Jeroboam himself is going to be killed. And that the people are going to be taken into captivity. But this Amaziah, he's, like, he's, he's got a bit of a political bend to him, right? So he, he's, he's, uh, he's letting the king know that this, this guy is causing trouble in the kingdom. But he doesn't attack Amos. You know, he sort of smoozes a little bit with him. It's kind of interesting the way he does this. Amaziah calls Amos a seer. That sort of implies he recognizes that Amos has some power, some prophetic power, some gift. And then he says, go flee, go flee. As if he's warning him that the king is going to punish him. The king could come and kill him. So go flee. You know, protect yourself. You know, it's okay. And you can go back to, you can go back to the southern kingdom and, and there you can eat bread and prophesy. And what he's saying is, go back down there and make your living, you know, as a prophet. You can go down there and, you know, tell the future and do whatever. And, but leave us alone up here, you know. We're okay. Amos' response is to tell them, listen, I was content being a shepherd. <laughs> I was minding my own business, man. I was scraping figs. I was just doing just fine. This isn't about me. See, God placed a call upon my life to come and say to you and the people of Israel, listen, listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say. Our culture is much the same as the one Amos was called to warn. As then, Satan wants all kinds and all manner of violence and wickedness. When I wrote this a week ago, the thing that was in the headlines was 109 people have been shot over the July 4th weekend in Chicago. You know, that violence that distracts from, from living a good life, from being productive. And then today I had to add this note. Our former president and presidential candidate, was a, they had an assassination attempt on him. What kind of a country is this? What kind of place are we inhabiting? And, and we get all anxious and, and, and worked up. I know I was up into the wee hours of the morning listening to the commentators and reading the news and, and trying to follow what was happening and, and making sure that, that, that our former president was okay, remembering when, where I was and what happened when President Reagan got shot and how Reagan himself got up out of the ambulance and walked into the hospital to, to try and show the people that he was okay. And then he nearly died on the operating table. See, Satan inundates us with a constant barrage of false voices in an effort to drown out the Word of God. Social media, nonstop news media keeps us all worked up and divided. Today, more than ever, we need to hear the words of the prophet, as much or even more so than the people of Israel. So I implore you, listen, listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say. And what is it he's got to tell us? What has he got to say to us today? Well, the true God, the creator of all, the God of ancient Israel, and the God of our present time, wants his word to be preached, proclaimed and spoken and written. And I dare say, dare say heard. Because through his word, the Holy Spirit will lead sinners to contrition and repentance. If we went on to read the closing chapters of, of Amos, we would, we, would, we would see this promised one that would come, that would change the way the world was, who would, they say, bring peace to mankind. 
And we would identify that person as Jesus Christ. So I implore you, listen. Listen to what He says. And I want to differentiate a little bit between hearing and listening. See, we hear a lot of things. What do we listen to? It's like a doorbell ringing. You know, we hear the chimes and we make some choices that, that come from the chiming of the doorbell. How do we respond? How do we listen to that chime? Do we go to the door and, and open it and welcome in guests and family and friends and, and become a host? Do we look out the side window and see an Amazon package on the steps and bring it in? You know, do, 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 we, do, do we see somebody soliciting uh, or, you know, a new roof or whatever it is they're selling door to door this week? See, we all hear the doorbell, but our response is, our listening is that response. What do we do with what we hear? What do we listen to? What changes us? So we have the words of God, you know, and, and, and we have all this, the scriptures before us. We have, we have all the books, and we, I hear people say, I'm waiting to hear a word from God. Well, I'll tell you what, He's got a lot of them for us. He's got a lot of them for us to hear. And He wants us to listen to them. And He begins by, by the response that is given in our baptism. When it's said to us, do you renounce the devil in all of his ways? See, we hear those words, but how we live our life is the listening to those words. Do we really renounce them? Do we renounce the ways that lead us astray? Do we renounce the ways that, that, that make us want to build false temples and idols? We hear the words every Sunday, Listening is how we live out our lives the other six days of the week, though. We hear them read. We hear them preached. We recite them back and forth to each other. What do we do with them? How do we live out that life? We hear the words in the Eucharist. And these words we really need to listen to. Take and eat. Take and drink. Why? Why? For the forgiveness of sins. Listening becomes an act of faith that says, I believe. I am forgiven. And then I can go back out into the world. It is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God the Father. It is the Spirit of His Son, Jesus, who is at work through God's Holy Word. Spoken through the ancient prophet, prophetic word of law and judgment, this same God uses His Word today to lead you and me to contrition and repentance. Through the prophetic words of promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ is created this faith that transforms our life. As we listen to His Word, we are led to daily repentance. As we listen to His Word, faith is sustained in our daily lives. As we listen to His Word, He leads us to eternal life. So listen. Listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.